Okay, we're back. We're back. And so in Act 1, we're going to talk a little bit about defining risk. And we have to do that because if we don't know what it is, yeah. we definitely can't assess yeah. it and we definitely can't mitigate it if and, we don't even really know what it is. And we have, there's a lot of issues in defining terms and, and that kind of stuff. And so the first place we'll talk about that is what's a hazard versus right. a risk, right? They're two different things. So a hazard is the hole in the floor. You can fall through it. You could fall through right. it. And the risk is what are the chances or the odds of you falling through the floor and what will that impact be? How serious is the risk? How serious is that? And that's called like loss magnitude right. uh, in, in fancy risk management. So risk management is really about we've got to assess that the probability you know, of something bad right. happening, if it happens, when it happens, and how bad the impact will be. Uh, mitigate that risk somehow. Try to do whatever we can to lower that risk a little bit. Bring um, the, or, yeah. To an acceptable level. Correct. Either either mitigate the probability or mitigate the severity. Right. Uh, and so that would be something like, I'm holding on to you cutting the hole in the roof. And you can try to pull me back out and of the ladder. And if it looks like, yeah, happens, you know, and, and so yeah. I can pull you back or what, whatever that is. You're not changing the risk of, of something negative happening on the roof. You're lessening the impact that's going right, to happen. Right, right. And haven't changed the hazard itself. Right. The hazard of being on that roof is, is, still, is still there. there. Right. And then eventually, once we do those mitigations, then we, we have to decide, do we accept that risk or not accept that risk and that's called residual risk and it's kind of like leftovers in, in the, the fridge, fridge. Right. <laughs> it's like okay how hungry am I how long has this been in there you know you know is it still good I wonder when this is you know how hungry am I right. it's got a little bit of green you know and you've right. everybody's thought about that right like I could cut that little right. bit off how far did that's that go a mitigation into it? Right. right that little green part I could cut that edge off and it'd still be good right and yep. so that's that's residual risk is the leftovers and uh you know, and then we've got how our cultures talk about safety. Yeah. So, like, so what do the you word, think of? The word safety, I mean, basically, it, it means free from harm. And so when you look at it, it there's, there's kind of a misconception that we can create. Be safe. Right. Be safe. Be safe today. Have a safe day. Safety I want is safe, number one. Safety is number one. <laughs> I want everybody to be safe today. What it does is it, it's kind of almost... I've heard you say it before, it's like a zero defect way of thinking. And so the theory is that if we follow policy and if we do things right and everybody pays attention to safety and everybody thinks safety, that you won't ever have anything happen. And the right. issue with it is we know there's risk in our business. Yeah. No matter what emergency services or military that you're in. So what I've always looked at is there's kind of a problem with looking at it from the standpoint of, well, let's just be safe. The trouble is every one of us has been to classes, whether it's an OSHA class or some kind of mandated training that we've went to. And what they do is you have all these things that you have to go do. And then at the end of it, a lot of times what happens? You know, you get a list of rules, you get a list of things they remind you to do this or that. And you walk back out onto the apparatus floor or back out into your mm -hmm. assembly line at your factory. And you do things the same way you've always done. We kind of have a safety bucket on our brain that, from the time when we were little when we went to safety town and learned how to ride our bikes to what happens is we tend to take that and I think we don't see the ability to I think we realize that you can never remove all the risk. So we kind of put it in that safety bucket and it never really gets operationalized. It just gets tucked away well, and it doesn't and, affect our behavior. Yeah, and, and that that comes from the school of thought. That's right. very it's compliance based, right? And right. compliance is important. If you're managing money, if you're managing equipment, fleets of vehicles, right. and, and uh, compliance is a critical component. But open-ended risk, it doesn't work. Well, yeah, you know, when you start trying to take compliance and use it to manage people's behavior, right? that's, that's where, oh, the system drives people's behavior. Right. And that's kind of that old industrial age type of thinking, Correct. right? And that's where we talk about rules versus principles. You know, uh, if yeah. every SOP is a policy right. and becomes a rule, what is the impact of that? And that, and that, uh, that zero defect culture that it creates, right? That's what happens with the rules. It's that zero defect concept. And we kind of do it to ourselves too because 
I think everybody who works in emergency services, like I, I know from my background working in fire, you end up in there inevitably at a barbecue or somewhere and somebody says, you know, everybody's asking what they do. And, you know, I work for the fire department and, oh, I can't believe what you guys do. It's crazy. And what do, what do we all say? Well, we're trained. Yeah, we're you trained. Know, we, we, we're we, professionals. We even minimize it. Yeah. You know, and we say that like we're trained, we have good equipment and everything. And then a lot of times we go to classes and we go to trainings and we talk about how we all need to get behind this and we need to reduce line of duty deaths to zero. And we, we do these things and we're, we're the other way to look at it is for all of us to just agree that this is a very dangerous business that we're in. Yeah. I Not because we're reckless, but there's a lot of risk present. So huge. once we understand that, let's and, focus on trying to mitigate it versus just saying we're going to get rid of it. Exactly. Because the key is it is an inherently right. high risk environment. Right. So at the end of the day, you've done your mitigations. Right. It's still uh, a high risk environment because of, of any one little failure point or change in the environment can cause this catastrophic loss. In Correct. other words, a good operator doing everything they're supposed to do that's reasonable can still get seriously injured or killed because yeah. they're at the wrong place at the wrong time. And that's there's what, so much you know, unpredictability. Yeah, there's so much unpredictability. And I think like your background with military, I think maybe military is more aware of that. So yeah, like the process of coming up than fires. I think fire, we've somehow convinced ourselves that if we don't break rules, we won't get hurt. Yeah, yeah. And and I, I would say, yeah, the military is a little better on that. It'll swing to that risk averse, zero defect side, but, but it seems to be able to self-correct, you know, over right. a couple of years and swing back to the other side. And that other side, on the principal side, that's where we have... Uh, Mission Driven Culture, or MDC. And so we'll take just a couple of minutes here and, right. and try to explain a little bit more about what we mean when when we're talking about mission driven culture. And so first is what are the, the, the core values of a mission driven culture? Uh, service for the common good, meaning we're all here to be, to serve the team, right. you know, to serve the mission, to serve the organization, uh, and that takes priority over serving ourselves. An individual, right. The high trust state. You've got to have trust with each other, obviously. You have to trust these, you have to trust your bosses. Bosses have to trust you. You know, that, that's a whole circle yep. of trust kind of thing. Pursuit of truth. So we've got to deal with situation awareness as it is, not as we want it to be. And right. This is where our catastrophic overconfidence comes in. You know, as an as a individual, as a team, as an organization, that pursuit of truth. Form and function defined by the end state, meaning, and we'll talk more about when the tail starts wagging the dog. Correct. You know, and everybody's probably seen that, yeah. right, that's watching this. And so we want what we do defined by what is the end state we're trying to achieve. Right. So everybody um, has a clear picture of where they're going. Absolutely, right. And individual initiative. And what does that mean? What's freelancing versus disciplined initiative, right? Two different things. So right, yeah. talk more about that. And finally, continuous improvement. You know, the nature of inherently high-risk environments is that we're constantly, you know, if you're only as good today as you were yesterday, you're not the same. Right. You've actually fallen behind, right. yeah. you know. Um, so when we talk about mission-driven culture, we're talking about dynamics where that situation on the ground, it changes fast. Right. It's, it's uh, very hard for any centralized, old command and control model to keep up with. Because you can't predict the future. No, and there's so you don't a, know what rule to make it no, at the time. And, and You're we, always behind the curve. And that's where we have mission-driven culture is made for this uh, environment, yeah. volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. Does that sound like the fire ground or Pretty the battleground or the right. battle space or all of our you jobs. Know, yeah, it's it, these incidents are incredibly complex and you're not sure what's going to happen. So basically what we're doing is we're trying to to delegate the authority to act and the expectation to act out to the people that have the best situation awareness that are going to act to make that judgment most of the time. Right. right. Not all the time, because, again, we have tunnel vision. We have, you know, right. things where it's like, hey, the chief has to pull everybody out of the building because they're too, you know, target fixated on success. Right. And right. so there's that side of that coin as well. Um, but the idea is we use leader's intent, which we'll explain. But you've got the task, which is what I want you to do. You've got the purpose, which is the why. 
and you have what are the conditions of success I want you to achieve. That's right. the end state. And that that's what I give you if I'm your leader. And what I delegate to you is the how you're going to do that. Right. I don't get into that unless I see something illegal, immoral, unsafe, whatever right. that, you know, that type of stuff. Um, because the reality is, you know, that old hierarchical paramilitary, that that is that's honest to God, that's 1950s. That even the military's moved away from now. In 1940s, right, they moved away right. from that, you know, and and tried to again, you know, swinging back and forth, but right. always, the the trend of the military is more and more and more to mission driven culture, not away, away, away. I right. mean, last year the Air Force vowed to get rid of a thousand policies, a thousand a lot. policies that need to be delegated out to the lowest level, institutionally. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty powerful. Right? That is. So what happens is when you have that very hierarchical command and control, you create a permission asking environment. Right. So when, when uh, uh, that's followers, we create followers instead right. of like operators who are always trying to, to accomplish the mission, right. right? Move forward to whatever the goals are, whatever the objectives are. And, um, you know, you hold on to that information as power in that centralized yeah. authority, yeah. right? So nobody knows why they're doing what they're doing. Right. You know, you don't need to know why. You just need to, if you do that successfully, I'll worry about making sure they take care of that successfully. And, and you hear that complaint generationally too. Why are they always asking why? It's like... Yeah, and it's it, always been that way. Right. This is not a why generation right. thing. You know, we, we have some People complained Sue about that before 3,500 that. years ago talking about the importance of purpose and, Correct. you know, that kind of thing. So uh, mission-driven culture, you know, whereas in a centralized environment, that operator hits a barrier. Situation has changed. Which well, happens all the time. They can't just, they can't, they don't have the authority. Right. They have to call up and act. Meanwhile, right. what's going on on that radio net? It's changing. Radio net's full. <laughs> yeah. You know, right? Yeah. Versus mission-driven culture where you've got that operator who is like, okay, I understand the big picture. Think globally. Correct. Right? I know my strategic intent. I know the context. I know what the agency wants. Here I am in my world, and I act on that to try to meet that end state. And, and you can compensate for obstacles to a certain extent because yeah. you understand where you need to go. Yeah, and that's done in a very disciplined right. way. There's actually more accountability in mission-driven culture than in that centralized command and control. Because that operator has to be able to explain the decision they made and why they did it versus... Based on... Simply, yeah, yeah. based on what they saw and how they yeah. understood it and, yeah. and their judgment. Yeah, and we'll get a rules-based we'll get, culture is. Uh, yeah, they just did you or did you not follow you, the rule? Whether it worked out or not, as long as you followed the rules. Oh yeah, fine. there's no incentive for mission success. It's more important to not get in right. trouble 100%. by following the rules. So really, mission-driven culture, uh, because that dynamic affects risk. You know, yeah. when we talk about being safe because I followed the rule, that actually affects our risk and mission success. So right. really. MDC, Mission Driven Culture, it's about lowering the risk of bad things happening and increasing the chances of good things happening. Right. You know, and, and that results basically in a cohesive, adaptive, and resilient team. And we're going to talk about those things, you know, Correct. as we go here. So, you know, I, I think when we take a look at, all right, so let's go back now that rules-based you know, rules-based. The old system. The old system, what does that look like? And so here's an example of a uh, policy that I've seen. Do not abandon the hose line. Right. This is your lifeline. Right. Verbatim, right? Now that's good because it, it did give a little bit of intent, a little bit of, of why this is your lifeline. But, you know, what do you hear when you, when, when you hear that statement, what comes into your mind? There aren't any options other than staying on the hose line. And if you do, you're going to get in trouble because you're violating a policy. It's an absolute. Right. 100%. You know, and absolutes, if they're written always, never, uh, you should do this, you should do that, do this, don't do that. Right. Um, that's the problem. So, you know, why did the firefighter get disoriented? He let go of the hose line. Right. He's guilty. Violated a policy. Violated, that, that's violated why a he policy. got hurt. Write him up. Right, that's why you got hurt. And if we send everybody 
you know what we could do is we could create an online class how important it is to follow the hose line send it out to everybody make everybody in the entire agency take the class target solutions right click it. sign off on the on the training and then we should be fine because we found a violation of a policy that already existed yeah so what we should do is send out a memo or do a training and obviously if people don't violate the policy but Maybe there was a reason why they got off the whole Well, line. and inevitably what happens is now you have another layer. Right. And another, another layer, layers of paint, right? Or, right? or painting you at the floor of a room until you finally you're painted into the corner. Right. And you literally cannot follow the policies on the best day. And actually the policies can actually start conflict. conflicting right. and stuff like that, which, you know, we'll, we'll talk about. So a principle, you know, mission-driven culture, that is written as to what right looks like in a standard situation. So a standard situation. So for example, maintain contact with the hose line. This is your primary escape route. But if we're not on our primary escape route now because something bad happened, we're expected that we're able to, within some parameters of, yeah. of, of training and of skills, we can adapt and figure something else and so out. This is the difference here where we have, this is the rule book and this is the playbook. Correct. So what's the difference? There's always alternate plays. Yeah. However, the rule book, you're stuck on one option and if it doesn't work, you're either going to not do something or you're going to ask if you can This is change. you will, you won't, always, never. This is in a perfect world, this is how the play is designed. Right. And you're expected to know this play. In fact, you will get, you know, in sports, you'll get fined if, if you, you don't, don't know, know the plays. Right. You know, so you are accountable for the play, but you are expected to adapt that to the situation. And right. you are expected to be accountable for what led you to that decision to make that adaptation. How you adapt that. That's the discipline initiative part. So, you know, why did the firefighter get disoriented? Well, there was a report of a beam and the ceiling had fallen in, you know, over the hose near the uh, attack stairwell. Right. And the firefighter tried to reach the evacuation stairwell, but went down the wrong corridor. So now what happens? What do we do with that? Right. I mean, the first thing is, what was the problem? If we'd, if we'd written up that firefighter number one, gave him a letter for abandoning the hose line. Right. But they're trying to find their way out still. They hit an obstacle and they're trying to navigate around it. And so now why did they go down that wrong corridor? What caused that to happen? And we might come up with, if we do a good job of asking why that happened versus punishing the person, we might figure out why that happened and we might figure out a flaw in our training or we might figure out a flaw in something and we're able to prevent it from happening again because th there might be something lying under the surface that's going to rear its ugly head time and time again and we can we can beat the first person who makes the mistake yep. and then just keep watching it repeat itself or we can take care of the whole problem at one time right exactly so you know it, it <clears throat> changes it changes how the organization reacts to and how people learn, and that's that continuous improvement right. part, right? If it's this zero defect mindset, you'll have no reporting of near misses or anything like that. Right. You know, that was, there's no learning. Right. If there's no learning, then you're just falling backwards. Because those are violations, and you don't need violations. to learn from them. The simple thing is somebody didn't follow the that's rule. Right. There's nothing else to yeah. do. Right. So really, it's around... You know, that takes us into acceptable risk, right? What's acceptable risk? How do we define acceptable risk? If we're in an inherently high-risk environment, it there's, means... There's going to be some there. You can only mitigate so much, and, right. it, and you could still have a high amount of risk. So what have, what have you heard as some of the standard mantras of, of how you deal with that? You, you hear a lot like risk a lot, save a lot, risk little to save what's already damaged, or risk nothing to save what's yeah. already gone. But Which, our principles. Right. It's a good principle, but you can't operationalize it on an individual incident because it's so so that building isn't worth somebody's life. Well, what is it worth? And and I, I've heard you say that a lot, like you have to flip it around. That fire isn't worth getting anybody hurt. Well, what is it? What is it worth? Is it worth almost getting somebody hurt? Is it worth damaging equipment? Is it you have to define what level of risk is left? You've said what you're not going to do, but you haven't yeah. said what you're going to do. Yeah. Yeah. No building is worth your life. 
okay, well, what is it worth? Yeah, but so, it's it's our job as leaders to tell our people this is what that is worth. It's right. worth high risk. It's worth medium risk. And so even, you know, you, you hear the old thing, you know, protect life and property. Yeah. Two completely different values at risk in terms of that are hard to do at the same time. triage in the order right. of priority. And even within one of those properties, so what is a photo album worth versus a pot in a right. kitchen? Right. You know, that there's completely different Correct. amount of risk that you take for a photo album versus the kitchen pot, right? Or 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 a building with irreplaceable records versus a convenience right. store that Right. And so this is this is where when when we start talking about this, this is where leaders intent really comes in and the whole risk versus gain type of equation. So we've got we've got leaders intent. So intent and, and that usually has three ingredients, which is task, purpose, and end state. So obviously this is what I want you to do. Correct. This is why I want you to do. This is what right looks like when it's done, the conditions I want you to achieve. But risk versus gain, this is where purpose comes in because what purpose is there to do is this is where you should be talking about the value at risk. Why are we even bothering Why to are do we what doing are we doing? This, right? right. So we know that there's risk versus gain. And so how this connects together, like what is the purpose of purpose? You know, we talked about the Y generation and all this kind right. of thing. No, the the purpose of purpose is to discuss those values at risk. The values at risk, that discussion defines the gain. Right. That's why it's there. Is there enough of a gain to justify taking because action on the values at risk, I which tells you, you what you're going to do? On this outside the building. Right. And now you're the one inside the building. I don't see the risks. You see the risks. Right. So part of leader's intent is empowering you, giving you the context you need so that you can continuously weigh risk versus gain and redefine acceptable risk Correct. as that situation unfolds inside that structure that I have no visibility on right. as that leader. And it lets me continue to move forward and make decisions versus at, calling out and telling you what I see, what do you want me to do? Trying to call me on the radio <laughs> right. when the whole world is... And describe you know, and play Pictionary and describe what I see. Yes, yeah, exactly. So, you know, when when you start talking about what that looks like real time, you know, an example might be, hey, ladder four, right? Conduct a primary search on the third floor. Uh, we've got a report of an injured adult male in three Charlie. Uh, I want three Charlie search completed and confirmed to me ASAP. You've got to be off that floor so we can start master stream operations. Right. I know why I'm going in. I know, <clears throat> I know what my value at risk is. And if I see a hazard, I can evaluate that against the ability to get that, that person out of the building. But if you switch that value at risk around, and the value at risk was the business's computers that are in a room because they need their business records, that now changes the, the math with risk versus gain. And I might hit an obstacle where if I was trying to find the adult male, I would try to push through it and, and accept a little bit more risk. But if it was just for the computer, I might decide, I feel bad for these people, but it's not their day. No, that's what insurance is for, right? right? Exactly. Yeah. And and so and in this case, there's actually two values at risk because we can't start this other operation until you're clear right. of that. And so it allows you to manage all that based on what's happening because now you're in there saying, okay, we're not finding this person, but I know I need to call back because we're and delaying report that everything else because right. we're everybody else is waiting on us. You know, so you have that context uh, to continue to make decisions about what's appropriate or not. And I think what that does is it, it enables people to to be able to do what we expect them to do. You know, we train people to be really skilled mm -hmm. on what they do and to be able to do all these all these skills and all these tasks and, and operate effectively but then when you put them in a rules based culture it's almost like you kind of you put you like tie them up a little bit yeah and mission driven culture lets your people that you've spent all this time and effort to train go do their thing and particularly this tool of leaders intent right. what it does is it help it helps set a frame for success on 
the next topic we're going to talk about in the next video, which is measuring risk real time. This is, this is where we as humans have a really big challenge. So we'll talk about that next. We'll talk about that next. All right.